Russian President Vladimir Putin is expected to hold a ceremony on Friday to formally annex occupied Ukrainian territories. Preparations are already underway on Moscow's Red Square. The announcement comes after people in four occupied areas of Ukraine supposedly voted in favor of joining Russia. The referendums were deemed illegal under international law and dismissed by Kyiv and the West as a sham. Some of the separatist leaders involved in carrying out the sham votes landed in Moscow, according to this photograph, in order to participate in the rally, like this Russian-appointed Kherson politician. We congratulate all Russian people around the world on this great celebration. We did it. Kherson region, Zaporizhia region, Donetsk and Luhansk people's republics will now forever become parts of Russia. Here in the city of Kramatorsk, in the Donetsk region, which Russia wants to annex, the atmosphere is a defiant one. And many are confident in the dismissal of would-be annexation plans by Moscow. For the Kiev supporting mayor of Kramatorsk, the message to President Putin is a clear one. Please don't do stupid things. Do not take steps you intend to take in confirming and accepting the annexation of our territories. The Donbass has always been Ukraine, is Ukraine, and will always be Ukraine. We will fight for that. Even if the annexation happens, our boys will let us be conquered. We believe in the Ukrainian armed forces. If necessary, we will fight too. The Kremlin is expected to treat the annexed territories as part of Russia, signaling a potential military escalation. As Russia prepares to formally proclaim the annexation of Ukrainian territory, a new study shows anxiety among citizens over the recent mobilization, despite these so-called triumphs. Think Tank Levada Center says 47 percent of Russians feel anxious about the draft. And President Vladimir Putin has admitted there have been problems. Many questions have arisen during this mobilization and these mistakes need to be corrected and avoided in future. Mistakes in mobilizing those citizens who can defer, for example fathers who have lots of children, people who are suffering from chronic diseases or those who are not in the accepted age range. It's necessary to deal with each case individually, and if we have made this mistake, I repeat, we need to correct it and bring back home those who have been drafted, contrary to the mobilization requirements. Testimonies have revealed that authorities are reportedly asking reservists to bring all their own equipment, from helmets to bulletproof vests. These stores are now overflowing with customers and stock is quickly depleting. Others have been less enthusiastic. Despite recent protests at the Russia-Georgia border calling on Tbilisi to stop the influx of Russians, huge queues, mostly of military-aged men, continue to form. Georgian authorities are delivering water and blankets to those who will be spending the next few nights on the road. This is just one of 18 torture chambers Ukrainian forces say they have uncovered as they reclaim territory from Russia. In Vovchansk, police point to inscriptions on the walls by prisoners and instruments they believed used for electric shocks. Various sources say Ukrainians have secured both banks of Kupiansk, which could mean the imminent recapture of the strategic town of Lyman. Further south, Russian forces have been intensifying their attacks. Dozens of kilometers from the front line, homes have suffered the most. And there's little left. In Dnipro, two children have been killed. They were aged just 8 and 12, this woman says. The whole family was already having a hard time because their grandparents and son were recently killed. She continues, it is scary and sad that civilians are killed in such a way. The scars of destruction remain in the Kharkiv region, previously battered by Russian shelling. While there were signs of a hasty withdrawal after a successful Ukrainian counter-offensive, the fear does not escape those cities closest to the border especially after Russia escalated its use of Iranian-supplied kamikaze drones. A big debate is dividing the EU on how to keep energy prices under control. 
The bloc's energy ministers will meet Friday to decide if the bloc will start building the basis for an EU-wide price cap on all gas imports. We know that most of those price rises are not really linked with the fundamentals but with the malfunctioning of the market. So we need to fix that and we're going to work in the next few hours to make sure we find the right ways of doing that. On one side of the room, 15 member states who sent a letter to the European Commission asking for a price cap on all gas imports. They say it's the one measure that will help every member state mitigate the current inflationary pressures and limit extra profits in the sector. On the other side, the European Commission, which is opposed to the measures, arguing it represents a risk to the security of supply. And then there's Germany, as the biggest country in the EU, who's fiercely against a cap. At the same time, the European Commissioner for Energy, Kadri Simpson, has suggested introducing a cap on the price of gas for the production of electricity at an EU level. It's a measure that looks similar to the Iberian exception that's already in place in Spain and Portugal. But Friday's meeting will also end with the approval of three concrete measures. The first one aims to reduce electricity consumption by a mandatory 5% during peak hours. The second, a revenue cap on low production energy costs, like nuclear and renewables. The third one, a 33% windfall tax on the profits of fossil fuel companies. The measures that aim to reduce energy bills for people are expected to be approved Friday and put in place immediately. Crystal Pitchers, Euronews, Brussels. EU energy ministers are meeting here in Brussels today to discuss the wide plethora of proposals on the table to intervene in the energy market to bring down the price and cost of electricity. Now on the table we heard during the week from 15 member states calling for an overall price cap on gas coming into Europe uh, but the European Commission has sort of dismissed this saying that it's too risky given concerns around global gas supply. There will be however a proposal for a price cap on Russian gas but it won't really do much to impact the cost or price because Russia only delivers around 9% of the EU's gas now. But one thing we do know is that time is of the essence because member states really need to make some decisions about the intervention in order for this coming winter. Shona Murray, Euronews, Brussels. After Georgia Meloni's far-right party won the general election on Sunday, some are wondering what to expect from the next Italian government, especially at the EU level. Invited by Euronews for a debate, several members of the European Parliament discussed the implications of the vote. For some, Meloni's victory is a test case for the far-right in Europe. For some of us, it is also an anticipation that what could happen in other member states of Europe, but certainly it's been a shake. The third economy in the Euro, big thing, is a major event, but also leaning on the extreme right for the first time ever, ever since the Second World War. So there is a lesson to be learned about this. But for this Austrian MEP, it is too soon to tell how the party will impact EU policies. We have to measure them by their deeds. And uh, this is why, as each and every government uh, in uh, the European Union, in each and every member state, uh, we will uh, have to see how they behave uh, regarding uh, the Russian aggression, uh, regarding inflation, regarding the energy crisis, uh, regarding climate change and all the different various uh, crisis scenarios we face at the moment. For the German Greens, Meloni's rise to power raises alarm bells, reminding that this has already happened in the past in Europe. The Greens are quite worried because having another extreme right government and a head of government who says she is inspired by Viktor Orban is indeed worrying for us. Viktor Orban transformed a democracy into an autocracy, as all international organizations say. If this is a role model for Georgia Meloni, we are quite worried about what is going to happen in Italy. I don't know how Georgia... But Meloni's defenders were quick to remind that she's had a strong stance when tackling issues such as the Ukraine invasion. Enormously high energy prices. So, Georgia Meloni, since the 24th of February this year, she was always on the side of Ukraine and to make sanctions, and she always, during campaign, even pointed out this line. But Georgia Meloni's nationalism really worries Brussels, as Italy is the bloc's third largest economy. And as Italian citizens' main concerns about the acute energy costs mount, many wonder if Meloni will turn her back on the EU. Thank you so much for being with us for this discussion. Pleasure. Thank you for having elections.